everybody. Welcome. Um, if someone could please also just respond in that chat window to make sure that you can all hear me, that would be wonderful, just before I go on. All right, perfect. Thank you, everybody. Much appreciated. So I uh, welcome everyone to the webinar. I'm really excited about being able to do this presentation with Blair today. and. Um, I, I hope everybody else is excited about it as well. In today's webinar, we're going to be talking about the development of score reports as a purposeful undertaking within the exam development process. We'll talk about what feedback to provide to candidates and how to provide that feedback. We'll talk some about the advantages of using a candidate management system for score reporting, examples of how technology can be leveraged to create meaningful score reports and uh, ways to offer more than just feedback to candidates. Jumping in, uh, we'll start with score reporting and look at some of the psychometric considerations in score reporting. The background for this presentation is a paper that uh, was written and presented at the American Educational Research Association uh, annual conference this past spring entitled Applying Lessons Learned in Educational Score Reporting to Credentialing. The authors of that paper were myself, April Zaniski from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and Susan Davis Becker, also from Alpine Testing Solutions. At the bottom of this slide is a uh, web link so that you would be able to retrieve that paper uh, should you be interested in more information about uh, the, the lessons that educational score reporting has learned and how to apply that really in an operational way to score reporting within credentialing. So today, we're all, why are we all here? We're here because score reports matter. They are significant and I can't underestimate that. What are we going to cover? We're going to talk about score report development because it is a process. It's not just something that happens automatically or in a vacuum. We'll talk about what feedback to provide that to candidates as well as how to provide that feedback to the candidates. So to set the stage, uh, his, score reporting has historically been an afterthought and not something that's really been considered broadly within the test development process. But this is changing. Test, test takers want and expect to know more about their performance. Candidates, especially in the U.S., have been tested throughout their education with varying amounts of feedback provided, and now they expect fairly significant feedback from all testing occasions, whether it's educational, credentialing, any situation where a test is administered, even medically, they, they really want all the information. Especially test takers who do not pass or who need to improve their scores want to know what they need to do, study, or know in order to have a better opportunity to pass the exam at the next administration. There's a limited research base and application on score reporting and credentialing, but there's a growing research base to support decisions made in score reporting from the world of education where testing is more common and increased with the No Child Left Behind Act of 2001. There are professional standards related to score reporting. So even though reporting isn't always prioritized, there are a multitude of guiding principles and standards related to score reporting. You may already be familiar with ISO 17024 from ANSI, uh, the guidance on psychometric requirements for ANSI, standards for the accreditation of certification programs, and the standards for educational and psychological testing. That last one you might just be familiar with if you uh, work with a psychometrician regularly or if you've heard some of the news um, that, that, that text was recently updated and just published and now available. Uh, other standards that are relevant but sound more like they would only be relevant to education would be the Code of Professional Responsibilities in Educational Measurement as well as the Code of Fair Testing Practices in Education. There's a listing in the paper that um, talks about score reporting and standards 
And unfortunately, that listing was created before the new text was put out, but it's still applicable, and the new text really was not a complete overhaul of the 1999 standards for educational and psychological testing, but an update to reflect more of the computer administration that's occurring within the world of education, more issues regarding fairness and so forth. So score reporting is still in there, it's still important, and I'm willing to bet that the mapping of the score reporting information is still quite similar to that from 1999. Um, and there, there really is, all of these standards um, have something related to score reporting uh, embedded within them and the responsibilities for the test owners related to score reporting. So what's the impact of a score report? Well, if the tests matter, then the scores must matter. And communicating test score information matters. The stakeholders want to know what scores are and what they mean. So who are those stakeholders? The stakeholders are the candidates, the employers, program owners, and almost anyone else you can think of who would use the score from an assessment. Which raises a question, without context around the scores, are they valid? And according to many experts in the field, without context, scores are not valid. And that's why we're here today, is to talk about what is the context that matters and how do we provide that. So what is context? Context can be comparisons to or between groups. They can be diagnostic information within an educational context or descriptive information within a credentialing context uh, regarding the performance data at a section, objective, or item level. They can also include narrative descriptions of strengths and weaknesses in performance. And they can include performance level descriptions of knowledge. What is the report design process? This is really one of the areas where we can highlight that K-12 score reporting really has so much to share with credentialing. There's a lot of research and discussion about clear and purposeful report development processes within professional standards. The professional standards that I listed a couple slides back all talk about score reports, and they talk about report development and what needs to be included, what should be included. So, of course, if standards require a development process, there will be multiple processes available. Uh, Jaeger in 2003, which though uh, 11 years ago is still relevant, talked about what to report how to report it, and how to disseminate what is reported as the three elements of a score reporting process. The process we're gonna dive into a little bit more deeply today is from Hamilton and Zaniski in 2012, and they outline a collaborative development process that really um, helps organize the process and thoughts around it. There's processes for item development, equating, standard setting, and countless other steps within test development, why should score reporting be any different? So looking at the Hamilton and Zaniski model for score reporting, the initial three steps are largely data gathering. You need to begin by understanding what stakeholders want and or need in terms of reports and context. Concurrently, you need to identify who the intended, intended audience or audience is, are for the report or reports. And then you should really concurrently also be looking at what are some examples of current reports that are similar to what you will be reporting. What does the research literature show? What does related literature within the field show? What is it that people are looking for and what's out there now? Once you have that information in hand, you start to build reports. But building reports is a collaborative process. It's not just a psychometrician or a program owner sitting alone in a room and making decisions about what to include. 
really, it, the process should include graphic designers, potentially IT professionals, folks who are content experts, stakeholders, and your, your psychometrician, and anyone else who would be, uh, have the relevant, relevant expertise in the topic. After you do that, you need to try out those reports. You need to do some data collection, field test reports, just as you would review your items before you release them operationally. You need to see whether or not your score reports are communicating the information that you intended in a way that can be digested as you had intended. So how do you do this? Well, I mean, you can release reports in a large-scale way, a small-scale way. You could do a focus group where you show people reports and see what, they, um, what information they're gathering. You can do interviews. You can do whatever works, but you need to find out if the people who are going to be using the reports are getting the information you intended them to get from those reports. Once you get that feedback, you need to revise and redesign. If it's a significant redesign, you might want to go back to those users and make sure that the revision is communicating the information that you had hoped and that the revision didn't make other information more uh, cloudy or harder to understand. Once you've gone through your revision, your redesign, you release your reports. And so once you've released your reports, then you get to the step of ongoing maintenance. You've released your reports, but the job's not done. The job's never done in test development. There's always ongoing maintenance. You need to monitor how the reports are being used, by whom, if people are understanding the information in the reports, you need to incorporate feedback that you might be getting about the reports from report users. Maintenance is especially important anytime there are changes in exam content, cut scores, anything that is changing what you're reporting, how you're reporting, or what you would be saying about it. You really need to consider looking at your score reports and making sure that they're communicating the information you're intending in the way that you are intending. So report layout and contents. Um, Goodman and Hamilton in 2004, a whole 10 years ago, identified five areas of weakness. Amazingly, those five areas of weaknesses are still applicable 10 years later. We haven't been able to solve all of these problems and we, we still have these weaknesses within score reports. So what are some of the weaknesses? One of them is the information that's provided. They identified both score reports that were displaying excessive information to the point that it was difficult to understand the report, as well as those that were lacking enough information to understand what was being presented in the report. They, they identified a lack of information about score precision or the measurement error that's inherent in any reported score. And it's important to make sure that test users understand what the score precision is for any instrument, especially in high stakes uh, testing areas. They identified the presence of unnecessary jargon. Um, this is likely related to involvement of psychometricians and others for whom certain terms roll off their tongues, but most of the rest of the world doesn't understand what we're talking about when we talk about certain terms, reliability, for example, potentially. Um, you need to make sure that you don't include unnecessary jargon. Explain or say what you need to say in the simplest way possible. They identified a lack of definition of or interpretation of key terms. Users need to be able to understand what you're telling them, and they aren't in the same field that you're in and dealing with all of these issues in test development and design all the time. Key terms need, they need to have a way to understand what those terms mean. Also, they identified cluttered documents. Um, 
people try to cram as much information as they can into a small space, and then it gets very difficult for users to interpret what is there, how to go through it, what's most important. Um, so another warning is really cluttered documents. Make sure your documents don't look cluttered. Delivery. How are you going to deliver these score reports? You need to consider the mechanism you'll use for reporting scores or performance because there's unique considerations for every type of delivery method. If you're delivering them online or via computer, a couple examples of considerations would be whether or not the reports are static or if they're dynamic. Are users able to do something or work within the reports and see different graphs, displays, etc.? What are the access rights? Who's allowed to look at the score reports on a com in a computer system? And how do you verify that the right people are the people who are reviewing the reports? If you're providing paper or hard copy reports, you need to consider the use of black and white um, printing versus color printing. You need to make sure that your display is going to be as universally applicable as possible. Paper size, all of these things matter, font size. Another consideration for delivery, when are you going to deliver the scores? Are you going to provide scores immediately following the test taking? Or are you going to delay those scores for one reason or another? All right, so we've talked about all of that, and now you're probably saying, right, but what do I need to include in these score reports? Well, pass-fail status is very common within credentialing. Uh, candidates need to know whether or not they passed or failed an exam in order to understand whether or not they're moving further within a credentialing program, whether they've earned a credential, or whether they need to go back and study more and review retake policies. Some programs report raw scores. Some report scale scores. Some report percent correct scores. And now, lots of folks are talking about subscores as a newer interest. The NCCA standards require subscores because they're requiring meaningful feedback when a program is seeking accreditation. What's the value of subscores? Are they appropriate? These are things that there is research in the field that talks about the value and appropriateness of subscores. So before reporting subscores, you might want to consider these additional facets before just saying yes or no to a decision to report or not report subscores. So what's the current state? Well, we have minimalists who provide just basic information in their score reports. They provide little context or interpretive information, really leaning to providing just the facts. They provide the date of the report, a description of the report, potentially a testing center ID, an exam number and name, uh, the date the exam was taken, um, the grade or pass-fail status for the exam. Um, some report a mastery or passing score uh, so that candidates know what the minimum score was that was required to pass, uh, so the cut score for the exam. Uh, then you have the actual score that the candidate had earned, and they might include an exam history so that you would be able to see either um, the, the number of times a candidate had taken an exam, the number of times they'd accessed the report, and so forth. Then there's folks who provide a lot more information, and they provide context about the reports. They provide information about score precision. They give an explanation of what's being viewed and how to, how to interpret the information presented. They'll provide links or directions to websites with further information about the exam, including potentially the blueprint, how scores are determined, who to contact if a candidate has questions, explanatory uh, material that might show a sample score report and help a user interpret that sample so that they would be able to transfer that information to the score report they're looking at. Some even report, 
provide the candidate photo so that someone looking at a score report would be able to compare the photo on the report to the person standing in front of them in an interview, potentially. The, the big takeaway right there is that reports are customizable. You need to get what you want and need for your use case. Make sure that you are getting the information that you want. And that's really key. In the paper, there is um, more information and actual sample examples of score reports that are being used in the field. And that's more than I can get into here today on this call, but I wanted to let you know there is more information about minimalist reports and uh, those folks that are providing more information in their score reports. Some takeaways. First, reporting practices and credentialing vary widely. I'm sure you've all already seen that as you look at score reports across different credentialing programs uh, and within and across uh, fields. Professional standards in credentialing and education have relevance to score reporting in credentialing. Make sure you're familiar with them or ask somebody to help interpret them for you so that you can make sure that you're adhering to the professional standards to the best of your ability. There's guidance out there for score report, score report development processes. There's guidance for what the layout should be and what the content should be and how to disseminate or deliver reports and across different types of delivery what, what you should be doing and how you should be doing it or at least some guidelines around those things. Agencies also have a responsibility to stakeholders, including the candidates, to produce reports that are informative and actionable. Candidates need the information from a score report to know what their progress is within a credentialing program, or what their status is in terms of passing or failing and earning a credential or not, potentially. Finally, investment in reporting is an equal and regular part of the broad, broader test development process. Score reporting can't simply be considered at the very end of the process. It needs to be considered throughout the process in order to be sure that what you're developing can be reported in the way that you were hoping and to be sure that your reports will provide the information that a user would need to interpret that information. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Blair Harris, our Director of Technology Solutions, who will talk about some operational aspects of score reporting. Thanks, Jill. Uh, and just another reminder for everybody out there, we do have a few questions coming in, uh, but if you do have questions, please click on your Q&A panel up at the top of your screen and submit those questions to all panelists, and then we're going to save some time at the end uh, to answer those questions. But with that, I will turn it over to Blair. I'm going to sh let Blair share his screen. And Blair, go ahead. You should be able to uh, join the audience now. Great. Thank you, Shane, and thank you, Jill. Uh, is everybody able to see that all right? And Shane, are you able to view that with the transition? You are good. Great. So as Jill mentioned, you know, she spends a lot of her time and, and day thinking about things from a psychometric perspective. As the director of our technology solutions here at Alpine, I spend a lot of my day thinking about things from a technology perspective. Can we do and support what's being asked of us? Is there a way to do things more efficiently? And, and so one of the things that I would like to focus my portion of the presentation on is, is the technology aspect of school reporting. You know, does your technology currently enable or limit your program uh, in means to how it's reporting scores? And specifically, um, you know, what sort of technology support does your program have? You know, is it meeting all of your needs? Uh, from computer delivery to pen and, or pencil and paper to any manual uploads for performance tests? Are your needs being met? And, and if so, um, that's great. If not, you know, what can be done about that? And then specifically looking at technology as a means to automate uh, the score reporting process to improve efficiency, uh, increase accuracy, um, give a repository for historical score reporting. So if an individual is taking an exam or multiple exams, 
uh, give them a place to go back and, and review how they did their progress. If there's areas that need uh, improvements on, they can uh, review those even after taking a break from testing. Uh, it also encourages timely turnaround uh, and frees up resources to focus on other areas of your program. So specifically, I'll be looking at uh, these five areas, delivery options and, and what are the common delivery options that are available. Uh, some of the things to keep in mind are considerations for format and layout, uh, accessibility to the score report, confidentiality and security, and then some potential opportunities for synergy with your score reports as well. Uh, so first is the delivery option. So there's three standard delivery options for um, getting score reports to the candidate. The first is typically found uh, it's on demand in computer-based testing uh, where individuals sit for the exam. Uh, the scoring is done um, on site uh, automatically at the end of the test or ongoing during the test and their score report is available um, shortly after they take the test and they walk away from the testing location with their score report. Uh, the second is um, delayed score reporting where individuals sit for the testing event and then some period after it may be as short as a couple of hours to as long as you know, several weeks or even a month or two, uh, their, score re their score report is given to them. Uh, during that time, uh, scoring takes place as well as analysis. That could be security analysis or psychometric analysis. And if you're interested in that psychometric analysis, uh, the webinar for uh, next month would be a good place to start. Uh, and then finally, there's a, a hybrid model that's a provisional score report uh, where individuals sit for the testing event, again, usually in a computer-based setting. They're given a provisional score report and then analysis takes place on their results and at some date in the future they're given a final score report uh, and that analysis is usually some sort of security analysis to look for anomalies within the data. Breaking those things apart, um, usually the test delivery provider uh, will handle all of the things on the left, but the things on the right need an external system or process uh, to be able to um, capture and produce the information in the score report as desired. And again, here at Alpine, we're not a test delivery provider. Uh, we like to call ourselves a test delivery provider agnostic. We work with lots of different providers uh, and see their strengths and weaknesses, but are, are not a test delivery provider ourselves. But we do have an external application um, for managing score reports, candidate scores, et cetera. And so this is where my area of expertise comes in um, and where I'll be referring to throughout the rest of the presentation. Uh, but just want to make it clear that these processes can also take place in other applications or even at the test delivery provider themselves. So, so the first thing for consideration is the format and layout. Uh, as Bill alluded to, you know, it becomes very important to provide the right information, not too much, not too little, but the right information for your program. Uh, some of the things that might be incorporated into your layout um, would be the branding. So I've got a, a member on my team who has been in the computer industry for a long time. Uh, he likes to joke that he was around when the punch cards uh, were used for computer technology. And, and that's great, um, but you know, that's several generations ago. And it seems in score reporting that we're still a generation or two behind. But you know, the branding layouts, the, the ability to really design a score report in a way that makes sense and captures what your program is after hasn't been incorporated. And so uh, branding and, and for your company and your program is extremely important. Uh, the next, as Joe alluded to, is being able to include the exam-specific information that you want your stakeholders to be able to view. And then in addition to that, any program-specific information. So it, again, that's another value of having multiple exams within the same system, is not only can you show how they've done on that specific exam, but you can also show them progress towards an end goal if the credential uh, requires multiple certification, or if there's a time limit for completing different parts of, of an exam. All of that information can be pulled from the database and shown um, as part of the score report. And it's often only the candidates who will, or it's often the candidates will only view um, certain pieces of the score report, and they may not view other parts of the program at all. So this is one area to, to really um, show and demonstrate what uh, is important about your program and to help candidates understand uh, the next steps that should there be some next steps for your program. Um, the other thing that a score report system should be able to do is provide separate layouts for past and failed, failed exams. As, as Jill mentioned, um, when individuals fail the exam, there's things you want to, might be able to present to them to do, uh, to study or to know uh, for improving their performance when they retake the test. That information may not be as relevant for individuals who pass, and so having separate layouts um, is critical to your program. 
the next thing is, is being able to customize options for presenting that feedback and not having to, to fall within one set of standards or, or um, charts for, for presenting feedback, but have the flexibility to work with your site method team, that your test sponsors and program, be able to provide feedback in a meaningful way. And so here's just an example of a score report, and we're not saying it's a great score report or a bad score report, it's just an example. It's incorporated some branding into the score report. It's got the appropriate branding colors, and it's clear to see um, that it belongs to a particular program. As we jump forward and go down to even some of the more details, we can see that the exam info uh, is included. We've got who the individual was, the exam they took, um, the date, and, and how they fared on the exam. We can also see some program info that, in this case, there's a, a certain set of um, exams that need to be passed within a period of time. And it shows their progress towards passing those exams at the given point in time and what they've passed and, and what they need uh, to complete for earning their credential. And then finally, feedback. And again, the appropriate feedback is going to be dependent upon your program um, and the expertise of your program, psychometricians, et cetera. But here's an example of feedback that can, can be given to a candidate down, in this case, at the section level. Once you have your score report designed, um, the next question is, how are you going to make that accessible to individuals? Is it going to be available through secure download? Uh, will it be batched together and printed for individuals who take an exam within a certain period of time? Or will we be sending it to a fulfillment center for printing and shipping? Or are you going to use a combination of methods, um, for example, maybe printing it initially and then putting the delay for when it will become available online? One of the things that we don't recommend is that you email out score reports. Um, coming from a technology background, uh, email is not secure. Um, you know, we like to think it's secure and, and that we rely upon it heavily, but there's definitely um, some potential holes within uh, email programs. Most employers have written into their employee contracts that they can view and, and access all employee emails. And then we find that there's often email sharing, especially um, in Asia and other countries outside of the U.S. It's not uncommon for multiple people to share the same email address. And so if a score report gets sent to that email address, it could be accessed by not just the candidates who took the test, but uh, sometimes up to several hundred individuals who are sharing that email address. One of the other decisions then is how, how much time or how long do you want to make that available? Is it important to give candidates access to that any time of the day, or is it simply a one-time um, access that they need and don't need continuing or ongoing access? Uh, if you do give real-time availability, um, are you going to build in potential delays? Is there a waiting period why additional analysis takes place? Or will that score report be available immediately upon uh, receiving the results? And while we don't recommend emailing out the score, result, score report itself, uh, email notifications to candidates are just fine. It's okay to let them know that, hey, their score report is available and they can come into the system and access it. But then just a couple of examples here. Uh, this would be a secure download. Uh, the individuals log into the system. They can see all of their testing events. They would click on one of the download um, links on the right under exam results, and their score report would pop up in PDF. From here, then it can be disseminated to the appropriate people. And again, as Jill alluded to, test sponsors and other um, stakeholders may have access to that as well. And again, just an example of a batch um, download process where here four individuals have taken uh, the exam recently. Those can be selected and then batched together uh, for printing and, and mailing out. And if needed be, you can go back to previous batches, select individuals, and reprint their score reports. Finally, moving on to uh, confidentiality and security. Uh, so we recommend that you take this into consideration for delivering your score report, that there's appropriate time built in uh, for performing the necessary security analysis. And, and again, you know, what that is depends upon your program. Uh, some examples would be data forensics and working with a psychometrician to look for anomalies or policy violations within your data, um, putting candidates on a watch list where when the results come in, those individuals can be scrutinized in a little more detail because of past transgressions. Um, and to have this take place before you actually award a, a credential. Um, I, again, if need be, there can be in-depth psychometric analysis that takes place outside of an automated system. Um, you can provide score report validation to third parties. 
So if I hand my score report over to uh, my boss, for example, he can come in, use an ID on that score report, and validate that it was indeed issued to the appropriate person. And as Jill mentioned earlier, he may consider including photos as well. So here's just a quick example of the validation process. Um, I hand my score report over to uh, my boss or employer. They're able then to enter in um, my exam and registration number and get validation back that indeed this score report was given to Blair Harris and he passed on the given date. Uh, this could also be a, a location for including photos as well. And, and finally, some opportunities for synergy. Um, so in addition to simply providing a score report, uh, there is some automated security scripts that can be run on the exam results to look for anomalies in the data. And those can be run in almost real time and provide results back to the individuals um, in a fairly rapid manner. Or they could have a delay built in if there's need to um, do additional analysis or to perform additional psychometrics on the results before sharing score reports. Uh, we also um, do score exams as well for our scoring module. And one of the benefits of having scoring done in a central location is that your key uh, does not need to be passed out to the hundreds or thousands of um, test centers um, where, you know, just one breach can put that available on the internet and make it available for achieving having all of the, having the key in one central location and having all exams scored in that central location uh, does provide a, additional protection for your exam IP. And then finally, there's opportunities to guide the candidate. Um, as Joe mentioned, you can provide feedback on what they should do, study, or know uh, for uh, retaking the test if they fail, or if they passed, what are the next steps? Um, you know, if you've got a CE program, how do they get involved in that CE program? Uh, there's also opportunities for um, sending out targeted emails or news articles to candidates based on how they performed on the exam. Again, same sort of thing. If they fail, they could uh, have a news article talking about study help or, or where to go next, as well as an email. If they passed, you could talk about the next steps in the program and encourage them to continue along in the program. That information can also be included on the score report if it makes sense. Well, it doesn't always make sense in every case, but again, through custom nice score reporting, that information could also be included as well. Right, so I'd like to thank you for sitting through our presentation here today and uh, turn it back over to Shane uh, to field a couple of questions. Great, thanks Blair. And we, we have a few questions coming in, but uh, we've got about 20 minutes left uh, in total. So if you do have questions, please feel free to, to begin submitting those. The first question that came up, and probably uh, direct this one to Jill. Let me get you unmuted. Uh, right now it says, uh, right now we are delivering our pass-fail immediately, uh, but would like to delay them. What are the implications of doing that, and do you have any suggestions for making the transition? That's a great question, and it's a question um, that's hard because candidates, when they are receiving that score feedback immediately, come to expect that score feedback immediately, and they rely on it. So while uh, changing when the scores are reported uh, isn't technically a psychometric issue, it really becomes a public relations issue because you want to assure candidates that you're doing this in an effort to increase the integrity of their scores or something along those lines. But you will have candidates who are upset and disappointed that they can no longer receive that feedback immediately. In large part, your efforts will be around communication of the change and making sure that you explain um, in, in a way that your users will understand and appreciate why you have made that change. But it's not, it's not really a psychometric issue, it's much more of a policy and a communications issue. And, and, and just to add on to that a little bit, you know, you'd also should be looking at the trade-offs and benefits. Uh, you know, will there be additional benefits from the delay? And if so, being able to communicate that to your test-taking population so that they understand the purpose of the delay and then what the benefits are. You know, it may be that they have to wait a little bit when their score reports will be available um, through a, a central location for an ongoing time period, and so they can access them at any time um, and over and over again should there be a need. 
Great. Thank you both. Uh, the next question that came in says, under what circumstances is it appropriate to provide the cut score? We find that people misinterpret what the individual score means in relation to the cut score. Sure. Um, the, the provision of the actual cut score, again, is a decision that can be made by a program owner based on what information they would like to give to candidates. It, the, the problem you raise about individuals misinterpreting their scores in relation to the cut score is a common problem and is one reason that many program owners do not provide um, in the score reports what the cut score was because it can create uh, confusion. For example, if a candidate scores just below the cut score, they are likely to call the program owner and explain why they got that one question incorrect and that they really deserve the credential or the certification and shouldn't have to take the whole test again without understanding that there were multitudes of questions on that content and that you're confident in the score that they received. So you don't have to post that information if that isn't going to provide um, additive information to your candidates or your score users. If you feel that the cut score is providing additive information, then I would recommend including information on the score report or um, a, on a, at a different location but that's referenced on the score report that explains how a cut score is determined and, um, and, and the meaning and provide a couple examples with scores just below and just above and around that cut score so that a candidate could understand how they should interpret their score um, and have that, those example interpretive materials available to them. All right, the next question that came up is, should score reports be different for performance tests versus knowledge tests? That is um, a great question. And the score reports can be different. Um, and ultimately, that question would need to be answered by your score users by going through uh, the score report development process and getting some feedback from your users. How are the users of the knowledge tests versus the performance tests using the information that's con contained on the report? If the only thing a user is using in when they receive those reports is knowledge of the pass-fail status, then the reports might not need to be different. They might need to simply display that pass-fail status and the appropriate context around that decision. If score users are employing additional information from the knowledge tests or the performance-based tests, such as more information about the performance tasks or other elements of the performance exams, uh, that are different from the knowledge exams, then it may be appropriate for the reports to be different. Unfortunately, there isn't just a set answer because it really depends on how the stakeholders are using those reports and how they're using the information that's contained and what information they are using. And that will ultimately give you the answer as to whether or not you need a different report for one type of exam versus another. Great, thank you. Uh, this sounds like such a short question, and I have a funny feeling like it's not going to be an easy answer. Are score reports required for certificate programs? That's an excellent question. Um, I, belie I believe that though it is a certificate program, uh, that a score report or some type of information to a candidate as to whether or not they earned the certificate or not would be appropriate. So it may be that in a certificate program, they would earn the certificate or not, and therefore the certificate is the score report. I would venture that those individuals not earning the certificate after going through the requisite elements uh, to attempt to earn the certificate would want information about what it was about their performance 
that led to them not being awarded the certificate. So I do think that score reports are part of the certificate process just as they are of any um, assessment process. They might just be contextualized a bit differently in a certificate program versus a credentialing program or other types of assessments. Great. We have a couple of questions left and a little extra time it looks like, so if you do have any other questions, uh, please submit them now. But uh, one of the slides, uh, it says in one of your slides you talked about ongoing maintenance of score reports. What, uh, what's included in that ongoing maintenance? Within the ongoing maintenance, and um, I, I highlighted that when, as we talk about ongoing maintenance, we, we specifically want to think about maintenance at points where content or cut scores or other elements of the exam or the assessment are changing. Uh, those are especially important times to look at your score reports and do maintenance. The maintenance that should be done probably takes you back to uh, the, the data collection field testing stage and the revise and redesign. Uh, if, if new content is going to be included in the exam, uh, if your reports need to look different because for one reason or another, branding, um, for example, or something else, uh, you are probably going to take a step back to the revise and redesign stage and then go and collect feedback from SCORE users as to the impact of that, those revisions and that redesign on their interpretation of the information contained in the SCORE report. So the maintenance is really making sure that the SCORE report continues to provide relevant information as, and is interpreted as you had intended over time. Lots of people tend to think that once a score report has been developed that it's a once and done and that you don't ever need to go back and look at it because it's fine. Um, I can attest to the fact that over short, seemingly short periods of time, information will change and score users will be reading it or interpreting information in different ways that would require you to revise your reports potentially to make sure the information you're trying to communicate it still has your original and intended meaning. I think that that answers the question. If not, throw something else in the Q&A window and I'll try to answer it more concisely or differently. So Blair, I'm gonna send one over to you. Um, what if my organization doesn't have a budget for graphic designers or IT folks? Uh, what do I do uh, if I want to correctly design a score report in that case? Sure, and, and programs are gonna vary by their complexity and size. Uh, we work with programs that have you know, marketing just for their certification programs and other programs that are a one-person shop. And so, you know, it doesn't have to be um, outsourced to a marketing firm, uh, but as long as there's consideration uh, when the design's being put together, I, I think that's appropriate. Um, you know, again, if you've got standards uh, in your organization, you want to check with, with those standards to make sure they're being followed, um, but it doesn't have to be done uh, specifically by um, multiple groups of people. Uh, sometimes one individual who understands all of the different complexities of the score report is just fine. Again, you'd still want to do some testing and other things to make sure the score report is, is meeting its desired purpose. Um, but it doesn't have to be a complex process with you know, outside designers and others to, to build a good score report, as long as those facts are being taken into consideration. Great. Uh, one more question. What are some common misinterpretations or misuses of score report information uh, that we see with organizations that we work with? And that might be, uh, that could go to either person. So Jill, do you want to try and attack it first? Sure. Um, common misuses or misinterpretations uh, really can be almost anything. Uh, lots of folks like to use scores to rank order candidates. So, um, for example, in an employment situation, um, the, the employer or the employing manager has 10 candidates whose resumes seem appropriate, 
and they go in and all 10 have passed the appropriate certification exam, and then they decide to rank order the candidates by their reported score. Uh, in most situations, that would be an inappropriate use of the scores um, by that hiring manager because typically the precision um, in credentialing exams is much more around that cut score than it is between the different points earned on the exam, especially, and that's especially true at the very high end of an exam uh, when a credentialing exam is really focused on gathering the most information around the cut score as opposed to the most information around the very high performers. Um, so that is one common uh, misuse that can occur uh, readily, especially within the world of certification. But another misuse that's just common within assessment is using scores to describe an individual or multiple individuals um, around things that aren't necessarily uh, relevant. And so that might mean that inferring that because an individual has earned a particular credential that they also have knowledge in another area, in another content domain, um, because you just assume that they would have the knowledge in both areas. Um, so those are the are, are two very common um, psychometric types of misuses that can occur. Um, if you want your scores to be able to rank order candidates, you need to make sure that the psychometricians that you're working with um, or the folks that are working with the exam um, and test development process are aware that you want the scores to be able to do that. Um, if that's a desired need, then it can be done. Um, and so it's not to say that rank ordering is always inappropriate, but I know that uh, frequently within the world of credentialing, exams are not designed to support rank ordering of individuals based on their scores. Great. And, and just to piggyback on that, one other thing is just that the scores aren't being used for their intended purpose. Uh, so it's not uncommon for, um, well, it is somewhat uncommon, but it, it, it does occur every now and then that somebody will want to use the results of the test score uh, for a purpose for which the test was not intended, um, or even look at setting a separate cut score that's not been uh, included into the process for determining whether that person's an expert or can be a trainer or other things like that, where, uh, again, the intended purpose of the test was not to test whether somebody is an expert uh, or can be a trainer, but to see if they have the, the knowledge, skills, and abilities needed to perform at the described um, performance level. Right, and that's a perfect example, Blair. Um, and uh, another potential misuse would be using scores to make decisions about salaries or raises. Um, that's something else that you could pretty easily imagine within the world of credentialing. You just need to make sure that scores are only used for what they were intended to be used for and how they were intended to be used. All right, well, I think uh, we're just about out of time, and uh, we are actually uh, out of questions at this point in time. So uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody uh, for attending today. Uh, Blair and Jill, thank you for taking the time to put together a great presentation. Again, I will uh, recommend everybody uh, to go out and look at the um, alpinetesting.com on our events page. We do have the, the newest webinar posted out there. If you're interested, please sign up for that. We'll also be following up here within the next couple of days uh, with um, links to both the presentation or the webinar today with all of the audio included as well as the slide deck that was used today. So uh, for those of you that were wondering if that was available, it will be. Uh, if you do have any other questions after this, please feel free to email myself. Uh, I think everybody has my email address uh, on the invite. If not, it's Freeman at alpinetesting.com. Uh, and with that, uh, I hope everybody has a great rest of the day and a great week, and see you next month. Thanks. Bye.